On today's show, let's get you ready for Cavs Sixers, a big, big game in the Eastern Conference. And we'll talk about Danny Green as well. That is all coming up today on Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. The music you heard on the way in is from our friends at Astro Radio. Check them out on Apple Music or Spotify. And today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. That is prizepicks.com. The promo code is locked on. I'm Chris Manning. Dime on Brox from Explanations for the Sword and the Just Basketball Show. That man over there is the proprietor of Write Down Euclid. Evan Damerel. Evan. Big show today. Cavs 76ers is a big game. We're going to talk about who the Cavs maybe best match up with in the Eastern Conference. And we're going to look at Danny Green and look at get take minutes from. Let's start with the Philly game, though. Joel Embiid, most notably, is listed as questionable for this game with foot soreness if he does not play and, and maybe rest going into the All-Star break. That game, you, would, you would expect the Cavs to have a lot, lot better chance of winning that game. That is our hard-hitting you know, analysis here about what not maybe the MVP of the league not playing would mean for this game. But Evan, let's let's just start. What are you looking forward to? There are some stakes to this game. What's tactically? What are you looking? What are you most interested in as we look ahead to Cavs? Well, it does depend whether or not Joel Embiid does play, because I think that. I mean, let's be frank, this is a game that still has quite a bit of significance. This is a game that's on national TV for Cleveland. This is a game where. Cleveland is riding a seven game winning streak and looking to uh, claim the third seed in the Eastern Conference. But I think not having Joel Embiid maybe takes just as a fan of basketball the luster from this game away a little bit. But if Embiid does play, uh, I'm morbidly curious to see how J.B. Vickerstaff and to an extent Jared Allen and Evan Mobley defend Embiid. And then also just matchups in general. Um, Will Isaac Okoro spend a lot of time defending James Harden? You'd hope so, but maybe Donovan Mitchell gets some of those assignments too. And then on the inverse of it, does Philly hunt a little bit of the weakness defensively that is Darius Garland? And I know Donovan Mitchell's playing harder, but he's still not like an A-plus defender at the end of the day. Like, Will Philly try to exploit that a little bit? And also just the MVP like matchup of things, but we can talk about that in a second because again, hinges on whether or not Embiid plays, but what are you looking for just, uh, broad stroke wise in this game? I think the big thing for me is start with the stake because the stakes of this game are very real. This is one of the the biggest game regular season games, at least at this point of the regular season, this has ever played together. I last year, I think obviously with Mitchell, this is a really big game. If they win and beat a very good Philly team on the road, they will have the tie break over Philly for year. The Cavs beat Philly in a game earlier this year. They only play three times this year. That that's a big advantage if you're Cleveland could nab that tiebreaker. It also puts you in third place going to the All-Star break. That's a really big deal. That is a really strong place to be when you have one of the easiest schedules in the league down the stretch, and Philly has perhaps the hardest schedule based on winning percentage over the rest of the season. You win this game, you're giving yourself a really good chance to be the, a top three team in the East. And if you're the Cavs, you're about maximizing the success of the season, maximize your play positioning. Winning this game means a lot. This is a game with real stakes. And to me, I just want to see this group grow through that for, for one of the first times. Yeah, I think I do wonder if, you know, so the, the, the game against Boston, uh, both of them that the Cavs won or the frustrating losses in the eventual win over Milwaukee, even if there was no Giannis and that one went over the Bucks, like those were good litmus tests. But again, like this is a Cavs team where in an Eastern Conference more so where every game matters at the end of the day and like the, the standings are just going to be really nutty down the stretch. And like you said, Cleveland has a fairly easy schedule post all-star break. Like I know they open up things at home against Denver and they, that's not an easy assignment, but comparatively to what Philly has to play, like it's a lot easier and this game could have some serious weight to it down the stretch. So you don't see the Cavs trying to scramble at the end of the season like they did last year 
where they struggle and then watch themselves tumble from a top three record in the Eastern Conference to a playing team. And that's that's kind of exciting in of itself because there's a little bit of higher stakes here. So you wonder, does J.P. Bickerstaff show his hand a little bit playoff wise? Doc, does Doc Rivers show his hand a little bit playoff wise as well? Like, Do you see some creativity and stuff that's maybe a little bit more interesting, at least in the boilerplate offensive and defensive sets. A lot of teams run in the regular season. Like there's a lot of intrigue just from the outset of looking at this game. Yeah. And like you go back to the last time those teams played. My, my Diakite started for Philly or excuse me for Cleveland. That's obviously not going to happen in this game. That is not going to happen in a playoff series. unless things have gone really wrong and the status of his contract changes because, because he's on a two way. He's not even eligible to like play in the postseason. That that's, mm-hmm sure that James Harden did not play in the first matchup of these two teams. So like you're in this position where you are going to get some different stuff. And and the beat part is, is probably the biggest part of it, right? Because I think that how the Cavs defend Embiid will be really interesting to see how they decide to do it. They threw bodies at him last time. Every team will throw doubles at him, ask him to make the passes, but he's Embiid. He beats them. The Cavs are an interesting position where I think you can double with Mobley when it's Embiid sharing the floor with P.J. Tucker, and if, if P.J. Tucker is stationed close enough to Embiid, Moby's going to help off, and he's one of the mm-hmm. few guys that can help really aggressively off Tucker and recover, and you're not, you can still bet he's going to make a nice close on, on P.J. Tucker, who doesn't really want to shoot anyway. So, like, that is, like, the tactical thing I'd want to see, and just in, in that sense, just the Embiid part of yeah. it all, and just seeing how Allen handles, like, the mammoth kind of responsibility of kind of ha- handling Embiid in a really big game I also, I mean, I could Evan see from Philly's perspective, like you kind of think, look, we're playing great. Let's think of the long game here. Let's not have him beat. Let's give him beat an extra day off going into the all-star break. Like that's maybe not a bad thing for Joel in, in the long thing for them. But I wonder if like how I wonder from like the Philly side of things, like if you were asked them kind of like, I feel like the Cavs definitely kind of feel like this has to be a big game. I wonder if on the, what, what Philly thinks on the other side is a team that is a little older, that has mm-hmm. a more a coach that has, you know, won titles and things like, I wonder how it's. I would be interested to see how they kind of view this versus how the Cavs perhaps view this. Yeah, I think that of in itself is interesting too. Just the age and experience between these two rosters, and I guess the coaching staff to an extent too. Does Cleveland maybe come out a little bit too amped up? This game got flexed onto ESPN versus the Miami Brooklyn game, which if you're the NBA, that's the right call at the end of the day. But does Philly take advantage of that and the fact that they're a very good home team and that Philadelphia is just a hard place to play in, especially maybe after some bitter Eagles fans kind of show up to this game tonight? I'm I'm interested to see how this game just plays out in general, but I feel like this will could be or at least has the capability to be a possible statement win for the Cavs at the end of the day. Like if they're able to go in, take care of business of Philadelphia, ride the wave of this massive win streak that they're on and just go in there and beat the Sixer squad, even if there is no Joel Embiid, there's still going to be James Harden. And they make a statement saying like, hey, this Cavs squad has had their ups and downs and they have struggled at times this season, but they are still a force to be reckoned with the Eastern Conference and they're starting to gel at the right time. And maybe this is a, a statement when a lot of Eastern Conference teams start to think like, oh, we don't want to match with Cleveland in the first round. The other thing about this game that I'm curious to see, and look, it's not the playoffs, so like it's it's hard to necessarily equate like that one for one in intensity and, and all of that. But I think yeah. and this kind of hints at segment two. I think one of the big dis- things about this matchup that intrigues me is just how I, I both these teams have to see how their guards are going to hold up defensively. I think I trust Mitchell and Garland more defensively than I do Maxie and Harden. And I and I want to see how that bears out in this matchup where like I absolutely expect to see Donovan Mitchell like see whoever is guarding Tyrese Maxey do what he that little thing, just wave them over, get a certain kind of screen, and then use it to manipulate it, get the switch or or, yeah. or kind of have a rotation where he can get in the space. I'm expecting that kind of stuff in the game within the game there. I want to see how mm-hmm. the, the guards kind of navigate that defensively and you know how Okoro defends Harden will be a big deal. I, I think that is the obvious place to put Okoro, deal with the yes. physicality of Harden, stay with him step for step. Like that is where where I would go with that. But let's go into break, Evan. Let's come back. And let's go through the top other teams at the top of these. So that's going to be Philly, obviously. That's going to be Boston. That's going to be Milwaukee. And let's talk about who the Cavs actually, we think, maybe match up best against when it comes down to who they think maybe they would have the best shot as of right now of beating in a playoff series. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. 
to play, pick two to five players, and they if they go score more or less than their price per projections, you can win 10 times your money on any entry. There's no competing against other people. It is just you versus the projections available. Price picks offers projections on any sport you watch. This includes NBA, NFL, MLB, NHL, PGA, college football, wow. men's college basketball, women's college basketball, soccer, WNBA, esports, MMA, boxing, disc golf, Euro basketball, cricket, and more. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. Quicker than the sad read. That's safe. They offer safe and fast withdrawals. Currently operational over 30 states in Canada. Download the Price Picks app or go to PricePicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. That means if you deposit $100, Price Picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, Price Picks will give you $50. Don't forget to enter the promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. Okay, back locked on cap, Chris Manning and Evan Damerill. Evan, I'm going to I'm going to ask first. We have three teams to talk about in this segment. We talked a little bit about Philly already. I think they kind of have to come up with the conversation in a big way again to tip my hand a little bit. But mm-hmm. which of these three teams, Philly, Boston, Milwaukee, do you want to talk about first in terms of how the Cavs match up against them? Let's start with the best team in the East right now, currently, and that's the Boston Celtics. How do you think the Cavs match up against? Like, it's an interesting matchup. Boston has seldom lost this year, and one kind of has a feather in their cap of beating the Celtics twice this year in pretty dramatic fashion. Sure, it's early in the season, but a win is a win, nevertheless. And I, I'm curious to see if these two were to kind of flash horns with one another in the playoffs. Like, how would this series go? The Celtics are the defending Eastern Conference champs, but they're also very young, and I still think they're trying to prove that they're championship caliber, whereas Cleveland's very young and just trying to prove their play- playoff caliber. Maybe going blow to blow with the East, defending Eastern champs is certainly a good way to go about it. And I think just of the three teams you mentioned, they're the second best matchup, I'd say, for Cleveland, but I don't know how you feel about it. I find myself very conflicted about Boston in this sense because I th- I think there are reasons to look at it and say like the Cavs do match up well. I I think I think like Mobley and Allen can more than hang with with Horford and Williams as a duo. I think over a seven game series, I would take Mitchell and Garland and Rubio over White, Smart, and Brogdon. As good as I, Derek White is playing awesome. Marcus Smart is awesome. Yeah. Brogdon's awesome. I would take Mitchell, Garland, and Rubio over that three man trio. The problem is you get to the wings and you think about Jason Tatum and you think about Jalen Brown. That is two really dynamic wings who do different things that are both having really, really good seasons. And I wonder how you navigate that. Yes, you can switch like Mobley will switch onto those guys and pick and rolls. Allen can switch as well. A little, he's a little I, I trust Mobley a little bit more on, on the switches out to guys like like Tatum. Maybe Tatum, mm-hmm. maybe Mobley just like gets that assignment from the get go and you just say like, OK, we're just going to like. You're gonna do this, Evan. It's it's time. Let's let's throw you on Tatum and and let's go that route. And maybe that works. I think there is just a little bit more risk. I think there is a little bit more concern with me in that matchup. I think it. I think mm-hmm. the Cavs match up like better than you might think, considering Boston is, is ahead of them in the standings and things and has a little bit of a track record. But I think the wing stuff would would be where that series is decided. And if the Cavs don't have a good enough solution to kind of navigate Tatum and Brown. Then it's not the answer. I have them second as well. Evan, the team that scares me the most is the Milwaukee Bucks. Yeah, they 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 scare me a lot too. And I agree with your points about Boston. I the forward spot, just you know, Tatum and Brown just being like a two headed monster against Cleveland is scary. But like Milwaukee is just a different monster because they have all the right pressure points to make Cleveland uncomfortable one through five in the starting lineup, and then. Maybe depth wise, the Cavs could have a leg up depending on just who is or isn't available for the Bucs. But like the Bucs are just a very solid team. And I was one of those people who used to dog on Mike Budenholzer a lot, but like the Bucs have learned how to win games, especially Giannis. And they're still kind of my favorite to. I know I said at the beginning of the season, it's probably going to be Boston. And I believe I said the Suns, the NBA championship. And I still feel pretty comfortable with that. But like, would not be stunned at all if uh, Milwaukee's playing for the title this year. Milwaukee with Giannis is just like a thing that I like. Mobley just doesn't have the total physicality for that yet. Like in Allen, it, it changes your scheme a little bit with Allen. Middleton being healthy is a really big wing that I think I, you know, maybe that's where Mobley goes and you have to do some really funky stuff. But then what happens with Brooke Lopez? They have a lot of shooting. 
there i think you're right about the pressure points like that is the one where i look at the different things they can do and i'm like okay i really think they could make you uncomfortable in big ways and like i think drew like they're gonna put they could put drew holiday on on one of those two guards and and maybe one of the other ones three and they're, then they're relying on like Javon Carter to, to play really good playoff minutes as, as a defender. And I like Javon Carter, but like that's that's maybe a win for you in some ways. It would be really challenging. Like I I think their personnel, if they're healthy, do present a really big challenge. And I, and, and maybe that's also just the honest part of it as well, just because defending him just requires like a lot to kind of break correct. And it mm-hmm. it, it a lot of it requires like a really, really smart strategy that works. You get a little bit lucky. And I just wonder, I wonder what like the right solution and how many different things you could throw at Giannis with the guys they have. I think there's a lot of things you could do. I'd be curious to see just like what kind of bags of tricks come out there. Evan, I think it's also worth noting too. I think it's possible that if the season ended today and you know, the Cavs were hypothetically matched against any of these teams, I think they might be underdogs in any of these series. I think they might have a puncher's chance against Philly. I think they have a puncher's. I, I think they have a puncher's chance against anyone. I think, like from a betting perspective, I wonder if the odds makers uh, would have them as underdogs in every series. Okay, I understand where you're coming from here. I, I would say yes. Uh, it, again, depends on who they draw. I think Philly. It just is the full transparency. Transparency rather is Cleveland's like ideal playoff target of Philly hitting the second round at this point, just because. There are ways to beat this Sixers team. I think Doc Rivers does a fine enough job just not making adjustments and being a little stubborn at times. I think that the Sixers, like you mentioned, are a little long in the tooth. And I think maybe Cleveland's youth and athleticism could run them off the floor at times. But there's also, you know, just the, the concern of the monster that is James Harden and Joel Embiid, which is a very, very elite duo when they're available. But they, the, again, the availability question is a fair question. But I, I think just, yeah, at the end of the day, because this cast team hasn't proved anything in the playoffs, it's totally realistic and understandable to okay, they're not the betting favorite or just the odds on favorite heading into any series just because we don't really know what this cast team is fully capable of come playoff time. Like we'll have a clearer picture in the first round. But again, if they draw Philly, Milwaukee, Boston, Brooklyn's now out of this conversation because of the Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving trades, but like they Mm. were a huge threat as well. So like if they drew any of those squads, but now just the three we're discussing, it's an interesting conversation. And I think we'll have a clear idea once we get like at least a full round's worth of basketball from the Cavs and maybe even a set, like how do they handle, like let's say a, game, a series goes to seven if you're the Cavs. How do they handle that type of external pressure as well? Like there's a lot of outside factors you have to consider. And I'm willing to reapproach this topic um, the second round if they drew any of these teams. But yeah, right now it, it wouldn't surprise me if they weren't the, like the betting favorite. Yeah, I mean, if they do play the series, like we, you, I hope you're willing to do a podcast about the Cavs. Uh, I mean, I have to like I really hold my feet to the on this one. Just to hit, just to hit on Philly again, I f- it feels a little bit crazy to be like, hey, this team has Joel Embiid, and like maybe yeah. pick against them. Like that, that's where like not this a, gets a little bit crazy. Joel Embiid, a pretty recent MVP, James Harden too. Yeah, well, but it's like Embiid's the one who like absolutely 100 percent strikes fear in me. Harden's having a really good season, like should have been an all star and, and stuff. But like it's it's Embiid who I think at some point is just going to like go off in the playoffs and like take through and like maybe, maybe that's this year. I, I just look at them as like the team without the bigger wing that can really kind of do you in. And I think the Cavs can handle some of the guard stuff in that series. I think like Rubio would be like really good in that series for for Cleveland. Um and like I like Tobias Harris is fine, like, but that's not the kind of wing threat that really puts your god in me. If if I'm JB Bickerstaff, like I feel I can navigate a lot of that. Like I honestly like just seeing how PJ Tucker would work in that series is 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 a reason I would want to see it because I just want to see like how what he his value on defense is like defending those bigger wings and being a guy yes. to like he's like the guy you get to defend KD or defend Tatum. What is his value in a series against Cleveland? That is like a really awkward question for Doc Rivers to answer. And then like, does he, is he going to shoot enough threes if Mobley's going to help off him aggressively to make them pay? Like that is such like a little thing, but I could just like see that clearly playing out in, in Cleveland's favor in some ways. That, and that's maybe one of the clearest things I can look at among any of these teams and say, I could absolutely see this break in Cleveland's way. Oh, absolutely. I, the PJ Tucker aspect is certainly interesting because you can, you can make, you can see the through line of, 
They the Sixers brought him in to deal with the Giannis's of the world, Kevin Durant when he was still with the Nets, um, even Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown as well. Like he he's obviously a step low, slower. I think he could be an exploitation if that's Cleveland, just because he's just not physically as elite as he once was, or when he was either playing center for the Rockets or just what he was doing at the Heat, or just you know in any stop, he's he's always been viewed as a wing stopper unless it's LeBron James he's having to go up against um, PJ Tucker. But it'll be interesting to see. Again, we have some regular like the regular season. You can't take a ton of stock from just because wins against Boston are very impressive. But again, playoffs are a different beast. The Cavs have struggled with Milwaukee, and I think they would struggle even more in the playoff time, uh, come playoff time rather, if they drew the Bucks. And then the Sixers game, I think if you have a healthy Embiid, if you have a healthy James Harden heading into this matchup, um, it's certainly a litmus test and like you can maybe get a little bit of an idea of like how this series could unfold just because I don't know. It's just, it's more so star talent colliding with star talent. And you figure out how like these chips fall where they lay it. Let's go to one more break back. We'll talk about Danny green, who he might be taking minutes from, but first today's episode is brought to you by built bar. If you're looking for a delicious treat, but don't want all the fat and the calories, then you got to try built bar. Look, we just got through the holidays. Now you're at Valentine's Day and you're maybe eating candy, getting that discount candy. And you want to make sure you're actually eating healthier when you're when you're indulging a little bit. So tr- try Built Bar. Don't compromise by having a Built when, when you have a Built Bar. With Built Healthy is actually tasty. They're so delicious. You're going to think they're good for you. That's perfect for your New Year's resolution. What makes Built Bar so good? Well, for starters, they're all covered in 100% chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. And they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter, brownie, and coconut almond. They have amazing macros too, only 130 calories and four grams of sugar with a whopping 17 grams of protein in most bars. And now you don't even need to wait around to get a box. For years, we've been talking about ordering your built bars at built.com and you can still do that. But now you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. So head to your nearest Walmart today, walk to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a box of built bars. You can get a pick up a four bar box, of cookies and cream, double chocolate or coconut puffs. And if you're close to Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13-bar box with hit flavors of briny batter and churro. Thank Evan and I later. All right, last segment, Lockdown Cavs. Evan, I think the place to start with Danny Green and who where his minutes are going to come from is with Jetty Osmond. I, I feel like the obvious guy that he's going to take minutes from is Jetty Osmond. He's going to be asked to do what Jetty Osmond does but probably just be better at it and a little more defensive minded in a way that I could absolutely yeah. imagine JB Bicker Steph trusting. Well, at the top, it depends what Danny Green looks like. He is coming off a torn ACL. He hasn't played in quite a while. Um, he well, he played the played sh- the played the three games with with Milwaukee or excuse me with Memphis. He was back before he got traded in wave. I, I know, but like I want to see what he looks like with a full body of work, maybe with more responsibilities, just because. We'll we'll see, obviously, but yeah, I agree with you. Like J- Jetty Osmond is the most logical path for Danny Green to be eating minutes from, just because at the end of the day, you play for JB Bakerstaff. The easiest way to earn minutes in his rotations is to play defense, and better or for worse, Jetty Osmond just isn't like a very good positional defender. He has happy feet, as Chris and I like to describe it off the air and sometimes on the air, but. Danny Green could eat some of Osmond's minutes. I think he could eat in Dean Wade's minutes as well. But I think just, again, he is kind of what the Cavs need. And it's impressive, at least on Cleveland's part, that they're able to somewhat address the need by adding a 3 and D wing, even if it's an older 3 and D wing in Danny Green. But again, like he's going to play defense. He's going to be kind of fun to watch when you pair him with like Isaac Coro at times, or if you want to get real freaky with it, Isaac Coro and Evan Mobley, because you can do a lot of fun defensive pressure point stuff on the perimeter of those three. And I think that's just going to make life easier for Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland, especially come playoff time. And I think that's just going to be key. And I think a lot of it's going to be the defensive stuff. And then I would assume the offense translates pretty easily. Like Danny Green is a pretty good catch and shoot three point shooter. And he provides you that spacing that Cleveland needs in theory, especially just with the size and everything as well. I keep saying in theory a lot, I know, folks, but we'll see what Danny Green looks like within this offense. I think it's going to be a slow transition. I don't think he's going to obviously be getting like 15, 20, 25 minutes a night just to start things out. But 
yeah, he'll eat into Jetty Osmond's minutes. I think he'll eat into Dean Wade's minutes. And then you probably see realistically Danny Green playing 15 to 20 minutes a night because it's been pretty well reported at this point that he wouldn't have signed with Cleveland if he didn't have an opportunity to play this year. And I think that's becoming more and more clear as you just kind of break down the back end of Cleveland's rotation. Because like I said on Wednesday's show, the Cavs are virtually locked in one through seven with Ricky Rubio and Karis LeVert being the two guys coming off the bench for sure. After that, it's a bit of a crapshoot, but the Cavs only go eight or nine deep. So Danny Green was brought here for a reason. I think he's the expectation at least to play. He's going to, I I would be pretty blown away if he doesn't like get a, a good, like run at playing. I think like all indications are that he's going to get minutes. And I think maybe he does, he's probably not going to play back to backs. I think he's probably yeah. kind of capped in that 10 to 15 minute range. And maybe that's expanded out by the playoff. And you'll, you'll kind of see what that looks like. I think I think like this just screams like a player that JB Bickerstaff is going to trust. And I think if you just compare him oh, to yeah. Osmond in particular, it's like, okay, they both shoot a lot of threes. They both are about the same height. Green's a little bit bigger, has a better history of, of defending a, over a couple different positions. I certainly not at his apex anymore, but is and can be a little bit streaky as a shooter, but like is just kind of like you would say like you're hoping he's like more level where Jetty can be. You're riding the jet. You're you're riding the jetty roller coaster a little bit. Like jetty's jerking you around, and there's, it's a little like all over the place. Pause. Green feels like green feels like almost like the wing version of like a veteran Rubio, and that like you know exactly what he's gonna do, exactly what he's gonna be. And I can I can just like imagine Bickerstaff being like, I trust that. I I believe in that. And like and then you I think the Wade shot is a good one because. If they keep playing these like big plus two wings or or you know four guards or however you want to phrase it, Green it makes a ton of sense in those lineups as a guy who can defend, as a guy who can mm-hmm. who knows what to do. And like if if they go away from Wade and they want a defensive presence and they're a little bit more stout presence than like an Osman or even like I think a Karis yeah. Levert if Levert's having a bad night, Green's gonna make a lot of sense there too. Yeah, and it's tricky as well just because the whole reason the Cavs, at least according to J.B. Bickerstaff, uh, the whole reason why they benched Kevin Love was to give Dean Wade more minutes in the rotation just because Wade is more part of your future plans than Kevin Love is, just especially on age and timeline and everything. But it's tricky because, like you said, Danny Green, and I really like that point, is like a defensive, more bigger-sized uh, Ricky Rubio where he's going to be that calming veteran presence. Like, he has seen a lot of stuff. He has a lot of championship experience with San Antonio. He won a title with the Lakers. Like, he has been through many walks of life. And part of the reason why he didn't last with Cleveland is because he needed to grow up, and the same thing happened to San Antonio. And he's a, he's, he's the adult in the room, as Chris Manning always implores the Cavs to bring more of the force. So, we'll obviously see how it goes but i just think with like dean wade and the like you said like going a little bit bigger maybe the Cavs expand the rotation to nine players instead of eight but it's just jb bigger staff said at the beginning of the season like 10 is his ideal rotation number and hardly seen him play 10 players deep at all at this juncture so we'll see how it goes but i think again uh 15 to 20 minutes a night he's not going to get a ton of burn right away i wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't play until maybe even after the Denver game post all-star break and we'll see how it goes from there but Jetty Austin's going to lose his minutes in this rotation and I think that's just like a tough conversation but I think Jetty is more or less used to that conversation at this point um, just because he has been in and out of this rotation to begin with but to your point on the second night of back-to-backs I think it's just helpful to at least have Jetty on your roster because then like when Danny Green doesn't play on the second night of a back-to-back you can insert Jetty back into those minutes and give him a kind of consistent, not consistent role, but at least an opportunity to provide you some offensive firepower at the end of the day. And again, we'll see how it works, like just come playoff time and everything. But I'm, I'm a fan of the standing green signing. Like again, he's in his late thirties. He's physically kind of not a hundred percent, obviously, but no player is anymore. And it makes sense just because Cavs didn't have to get up a ton of assets to, Kind of make that lateral. Give up, they gave up zero. Minute. Yeah, they gave up zero. They gave up, they gave up zero anything. Like they have an open roster spot. They didn't have to cut anyone. They didn't have to do anything to acquire Danny Green. And that's all you can really do when you're a cat team like the Cavs who have limited assets and you need to kind of address a need. And this is this is the best avenue in my eyes. Unless you know something dramatic happens and the Cavs are like oh, we should walk the Danny Green signing back. But until then, I mean, I mean, I, it, but here's the thing. I don't. I think Danny Green is a signing that, like, 
based on his track record as a teammate, based on his track record as a locker room guy, if he doesn't like look right physically after he plays 10 games for you, and you, ha- you go back to Osman or like Dean Wade gets more that's, minutes or that's whatever. That's a fair point, too. Is like if he doesn't look right, you can easily walk this right back and put Jetty back in his role. You're going to get a elite locker room guy. You're going to get a guy that I think is going to help the young guys. Like This screams to me a guy that like I, you hope Isaac Okoro soaks up a ton from him. If, if Danny Green's only here the rest of this year and goes somewhere else next year, you want Okoro to soak up a from him the next couple months. You want Evan Mobley to learn about being a pro from Danny Green the next couple months. Yeah. Like, this is going to be a good experience in that way. And it, it's like we we can joke. Like I, I sometimes can be a little cynical about like what they say about culture and all that stuff. I, I tend to believe it more when you get Danny Green who like, no, I don't think I've ever read a bad word about coaches, teammates, mm-hmm. anyone has ever said about Danny Green. And he's going to come in and I think and be that at the very least. At the very least, he, he is going to be that. I also, I think, Evan, the last thing that's a benefit, and we'll get out of here, fits with the guards. Like, you don't, you don't have to, like, you don't need to worry about, like, needing to get, like, pick and roll opportunities. Like, he's just going to play off of Mitchell and Garland, and it, like, whichever one you're playing with more often than not, it, I think it, they're fine. You could tell me one of them makes sense. I do think, like, he screams to me a guy that if Garland's going to drive in and create and do some of the wicked passing out that he loves to do, mm-hmm. Green's going to get some like open catch and shoot opportunities and, and maybe like that. That's just like enough to, to be value. I'm it's going to be fun. I'm curious to see what he has to say whenever he gets around to speaking. Um, yeah. You know, I hope I hope I really, really hope some sicko that we see at Rock and Mortgage Field has had a Danny Green jersey from way back when I know s- someone out there has to have bought one. And I just really want to see it in person. I would like to see it, too. I think that'd be quite the the, the look see i mean it's a be certainly rarer than a dylan winler jersey which i've seen several of this season but we see some you you really do see some really weird like we see some weird jerseys walk around and i'm like why did you like who bought this common one but i understand the meme aspect of it i guess but i thought you're gonna go with the fact that like dating green and donovan mitchell are tight and like don Danny green is a guy donovan mitchell like looked up to when he was growing up as a player like didn't like what he did to LeBron in the heat back in the day, because Donovan Mitchell is a LeBron fan first and foremost. But I think that's like you said, nothing really bad out there about Danny Green. And I think he's only going to bring you positive and good things in this locker room. And yeah, Isaac Okoro soaked this up. Hey, Jetty Osman, if you want to learn earn minutes in this rotation, if you're somehow in Cleveland next season, maybe pick Danny Green's brain a little bit to figure out how to play defense. Percent. All right, let's end there. I'm Chris Manning. That's Evan Damrell. Thanks again to Jake Stevens for producing. Back at you. Cav Sixers. Peace out, boys.